All right. what we're doing. Okay. <clears throat> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Smoking Simeon podcast on this lovely Thursday morning. Uh, today, I have somebody who I haven't spoken to in a while, which um, I've, uh, you know, it's kind of a theme on here. <laughs> um, Mr. Ace Aceto, how are you, my friend? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Um, again, we had last time we spoke uh, was my first open mic. Was it really that <laughs> long ago? And how yes, many uh, how many years ago was that? That was, I think I was. You were 18. a senior, right? Yeah. You were a senior in high school. It was for your high school project, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. I was. Uh, I think I was eighteen, and I think I brought the whole crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's right. It was uh, yeah. It was at the uh, the pub on Park. Mr. John Parada was putting it together. That's right. Yeah. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't spoken to him in a while. Oh, you should get him on. He'll do it. He's uh, yeah. he he he's he's got his own show too. He does uh, a weekly check in with uh, different comics and stuff like that. But really, but yeah, yep. Yeah, it's well, I think this is what we all did. Every comic decided to do a podcast because uh, we didn't have any stages to work on anymore. So, right. <laughs> you know, yeah, trying yeah. to keep ourselves busy and, and keep talking to people, you know, because we're social people. So, right. Yeah, it's de definitely um, I think the comedy scene as a whole has definitely benefited from podcasts, not only just because, oh, yeah. you know, last year being <clears throat> shut down, but just in general. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you look at some of the it's funny when you look at guys that started podcasting and they just started it just to try it, you know, just to do it and talk to, you know, and talk to friends long before COVID. Um, and you look at just how big some of them have gotten. I mean, you right. know, the blueprint, really. I mean, Mark Marin's WTF is like the the original, you know, comedy podcast. And then, you know, Joe Rogan decided to do it. And then it just, you know, I mean, his, his is the hugest podcast, but right. every, you know, a lot of comics have them now, um, which is good. I mean, there's, there's all different ways to consume comedy. And the good thing about, um, about podcasts is you get to talk to people and it's kind of, uh, it's not necessarily written material, you know, it's just having fun and hanging out with, uh, with people and being funny, you know? Right. I almost think of it as um, like thinking out loud. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so when did you, when, when was the first time you were like, I want to try stand up comedy? And then how was that compared to when you were like, wow, I really actually like this? Yeah. So the first time, what happened was I grew up in, you know, same town as you in North Providence. And, uh, I used to work at a supermarket called Almax, which isn't around anymore. Yep. And, uh, and I always did impressions growing up as a kid. I always did impressions, uh, you know, TV, you know, TV movies, cartoon characters, stuff like that. And what happened was at, every night before Almax would close, the front end manager would get on the loudspeaker. And this was way before they, you know, stayed open 24 hours. They used to just close at nine the store manager would get on and, and kind of make the, you know, final announcements like, Hey, please finish up your shopping. We're going to be closing in five minutes. And what happened was I used to do an impression of each one of the front end managers that we had. And I would ask them, Hey, can I do, can I do your voice? Can I do the, <laughs> the, you know, the announcements at the end of the night? And they, you know, they, most of them used to be like, yeah, go ahead. So I would do those announcements. And at the time I was 16, 17 and all the older kids who were like 21, 22, uh, up to like 25, they all used to go to this club called Periwinkles, which was the original comedy club in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And they always used to tell me when I would get on the loudspeaker, they're like, Oh my God, you do that. So good. You're so funny. You should do, you, you should try comedy. You should try going down to Periwinkles. And for probably about four years, I used to say that, like people would say it, oh, you're funny. You do this, you do those voices. That's really funny. And I'd say, yeah, one of these days I'm going to go down to Periwinkles. I'm going to try out. And I just never did, you know, <laughs> and then, and then all of a sudden I was listening to the radio and WBRU, which used to be Brown University's, you know, 
uh, radio station. Right. They used to have a contest every year. This was what a lot of places used to do. And it used to hook up with a radio station. And it was because summertime is typically a pretty slow time for comedy. And so what they would do is they would have these comedy contests or, you know, Boston used to have the WBZ comedy riots. Um, Rhode Island, you know, WBRU used to have the, you know, WBRU comedy contest. And it was basically a way to get people into the clubs during the summer. So what you would do is you, they would have a, hold a contest and it was all open mic people, first time people, you know, or, mm-hmm. or newer people. But, you know, when you're new to your point from before, when you said that your first open mic night, you had the whole crowd, you had all those people there. Right. So same thing. I had a bunch of people who I knew would come out and see me. And so what I did was I called up this guy, Charlie Hall, who was like the godfather of Rhode Island comedy. Charlie Hall and Frank O'Donnell are the original guys that started the comedy scene here in Rhode Island. And uh, and they I I called Charlie and I said, uh, you know, can I get on the contest? And he said, yeah, what's your name? And at the time, I just my nickname in North Providence was Ace. And but you can remember, I started in 1989. That was the first time I got up on stage. And in 1989, that was the year that Andrew Dice Clay sold out uh, Madison Square Garden, had his HBO special, was just Mm -hmm. huge. He had blown up a couple of years before that. He was on the uh, Rodney Dangerfield's Young Comedian special, and he just exploded. So when Charlie asked my name, I said, well, I'm Richard Ace Aceto. Cause I figured <laughs> Andrew Dice Clay, you know, I'll use all right. three names. And that's how I went for the first few years uh, that I was doing comedy. So that first time it was just literally, it was a contest night. I had no act. I had no written material. I just did what I always did around my friends. It was, I'd act out movie scenes, but I would do the voices for them uh, for the, right. you know, for the movie scenes. And, you know, it was good enough that night that I ended up coming in second on the contest for that particular night. So I made it to the semifinals and finals. Obviously, I got knocked out, you know, I think it was in the semifinals. I got knocked out. Um, But, you know, it helped me realize like, oh, you know what? I think I can do this. I'm going to try, you know, and Charlie came up to me, gave me the best advice. And I thank him to this day. He said. If you do impressions, you're always going to be a crowd pleaser. Crowds are always going to like impressions. But if you're really serious about doing comedy, uh, you got to write some original material. Like, write about your life. Because then this way, no one can ever say you stole their material because you're writing from your life, your experience. And so that's what I did. A couple of months, I went away and didn't go back on stage for maybe three months. Mm -hmm. and started trying to think like, what is my life? I don't know. I'm frigging, you know, I'm 21 years old. Um, I went to Catholic school most of my life. And I remembered one of the things that I would do was an impression, actually something I picked up from another friend of mine. Uh, I did an impression of these two radio guys that were local here in Rhode Island. One guy was named Bud Taves. He was the announcer for WPRO. And then Mike Sheridan was the traffic guy. And so I used to do this spiel about how it sucked going to Catholic school as a kid because we always had school. And during a snowstorm, we still had school. And so I built this whole kernel of an act around being a kid and not even realizing like that was gonna hit with audiences, especially in Rhode Island and, and New England. Just being a kid praying for Catholic school to cancel and having them not cancel it and ultimately (laughs) having to deal with listening to these two guys on the radio uh, where you couldn't understand half of what they were saying. And that's what I wrote. That was my first five minutes of my act. And a friend of mine, when I was trying to write this, my best friend said, hey, you do Gilbert Gottfried and Bobcat Goldway. Those are really loud guys. Like those guys would be funny as morning radio guys wouldn't that be funny and i'm like oh yeah you know what so then it just i piled onto it and that was the basic part of my act was uh you know 
talking about going to Catholic school, waiting for school cancellations, listening to those guys where I would do the impression of Bud Taves and Mike Sheridan. But then I'd say, you know, if you're going to get me up in the morning, get me up with someone good, someone that's going to get me going. I wanted to hear an AM radio morning show with school cancellations went more like this. And right. then I would break into my Gilbert Gottfried and Bob Cackleway, which were loud, obnoxious, over the top voices. And that's really, that's kind of how it happened. And I haven't stopped since, you know, I, and, I got bit by the bug. Yeah. And that's, that's uh, of course, great advice. And the reason that that makes that funny is because somebody like me who also went to Catholic school yeah. resonates with that completely. I think right. that's, the 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 artistry that comes with stand up comedy and being a comic is getting something that everybody's thinking or or, or a bunch of people yeah. are feeling and getting it out there and and essentially saying it in a funny way. Exactly, and that's it. Yeah, yeah it's 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 the commonality. And when I stopped and I thought about it, because you know I had been a fan of stand up before that, the first uh, the first time I remember really watching stand up. It was uh, it was in like 1982. I was in like eighth grade and I wasn't supposed to be watching it. But George Carlin at Carnegie Hall uh, oh, was was on HBO. And I just remember going, wow, that's that guy's job. That looks like so cool. That looks like so much fun. But I also remembered what made him funny in that was he talked about stuff that was I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. that's my life. <laughs> Holy crap. Like, right. Yeah. One of the, his, one of his most genius jokes. And for him, it was probably just a throwaway. He said, you ever go to make a sandwich and you always reach back through two or three slices to get to the good bread. <laughs> the and good I was bread. like, holy <laughs> shit. I do that. Everyone <laughs> yeah. does that. Why do we do that? You know? Right. And that made me, so to your point, finding that commonality that is going to resonate with a lot of people. So even though I do the stuff about going to Catholic school, I bring the public school people into the joke at first. Right. So I'll say how many people went to Catholic school and inevitably because power of suggestion, I raise my hand. Everyone raises their hand if they went to Catholic school, which mm. then allows me to do the second part of the joke going, look, they're so shell shocked from the nuns. They're still raising their hands. They don't even know how to clap. <laughs> right. And then I say, now who went to public school? And then, you know, they always clap and I go, yeah, right. look at you obnoxious. You know, you guys, you guys are obnoxious. You, you know, you clap rubbing it in on us. And <laughs> I'll say, I have to say this. I know there's more of you guys, but we have on behalf of the Catholic school kids, we have hated you since we were six years old. And I'll tell you why. And that brings me into the whole waiting for school cancellations, listening to AM radio. But even though I'm talking about what it was like to be Catholic and go to Catholic school, I brought the public school people along with me to say, yeah, here's what you guys missed out on. Here's the crap that you guys missed out on going to public school. Right. So, and yeah, it's finding commonality is is really important. Right. And uh, and that just you describing that process of saying that joke and, and creating that joke it just shows how long you've been doing it for because i'm oh, sure yeah. when you were at the beginning none of that was going through your head oh, you're no. just going up there being funny well yeah you're <laughs> going up funny. there or trying to be funny and then yeah. trying to figure out okay that worked you know this is way before we had the voice memo on the iphone you know you had uh i don't even know if i have it here but we, you know you had the uh you know micro cassette recorders that you used to right. record your set on and stuff and, you know, it was trial and error. You didn't know why it hit. You knew that, oh, I changed my inflection on this job, on this word, or I took this word out and put this one in and it worked. Let me see if that continues to work. Um, it's not until years later, after you've been doing it for a while, that you realize why it worked, you know, when right. you break it down. I never understood it. I didn't purposely say how many people went to Catholic school and raised their hand. It's just what I did. And I never right. realized like, oh, that's why everyone's raising their hand because I'm raising my hand. I'm doing the power of suggestion. If I went, if I went like this, hey, how many people went to Catholic school? Then people would clap. But sure. that wouldn't that wouldn't allow me to do the joke about the nun, you know, being shell shocked from nuns where God forbid you, if you ever clapped in in class, you get the, you know, the ruler across the knuckles. So 
I didn't understand why I did it. I just knew that worked. And right. years later, I was like, oh, that's why that works, you know? Right, right. It's funny that you bring up the tape recorder and, and the recording yourself because yeah. um, I'm reading, ladies and gentlemen, Lenny Bruce yep. currently. Yeah. Um, and and they talk, he, uh, right now I'm in the portion where it's talking about how he's really refining his jokes in a way that nobody was at that time. He was recording himself tweaking yep. words his inflection this type of thing and i'm reading it and i'm like wow this is this is what people do now this is just this is stand-up comedy now but back then it was revolutionary uh, absolutely that's why he's a pioneer you know aside from what he's known for with the dirty words and being the first one you know to really use dirty words to to that point he also took it seriously and really mm -hmm. refined it and really um you know, what you talked about before, speaking the truth, because there's a kernel of truth in every funny, in every funny bit. There's a there's a piece of truth in that. And that's if you stick with the truth, that's what's going to get people to laugh. You know what I mean? Right. So. Yeah. I mean, he, he was he was one of the first like s real cynical guys. Yeah. You know, talking about things in the newspaper and that type of stuff. And now it's like, you know, he went to jail for those type of things. Yeah. And yeah. now anybody can say whatever they want, essentially. Well, now it's like, uh, you know. Well, it might, I don't know. It might be changing. <laughs> we might be going back into the dark ages. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's, you know, but I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. In one sense, I get scared, uh, you know, because of cancel culture and stuff like that. But in another sense, I also look at it as you have to be good enough to negotiate you know, I had someone on my podcast. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Bob Marley out of uh, out of Maine. And right. he said one of the things some guys are really good negotiators. And when we were talking about it. He said what negotiation is, is you say something and it might be outrageous. It might be crazy out there. And you might get a little bit of backlash from people in the audience at first, like a groan or a moan or something the great negotiators are the people that say, no, 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 wait, let me explain. Hold on. Yes, right. I said this, but let me explain why I said that. And then they explain it to the point where by the end, you're sitting there going, he's got a point. I can't argue that. And some of the greatest negotiators are like Bob Marley. Uh, Bill Burr is a huge yes. negotiator. Yes. Joe Rogan, Louis C.K., these are guys that, you know, Bobby Kelly, you know, they they know how to negotiate. They're going to say something outrageous, but they're going to bring you around or at least try and bring you around by the end of it. You know, by the end of the, the joke, you have to sit there and say, all right, there's a kernel of truth there. He's not right. He's not just, you know, he's not just saying stuff to be outrageous, but that takes a talent because there's a lot of people that will try and emulate a comic like them. And they'll just be able to throw the outlandish or outrageous thing out there, but not negotiate themselves out of the hole. And that's right. the difference between being experienced and not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another guy that does, he, I think he does that, but he also can sometimes go overboard is mm -hmm. somebody that I actually like. I love the, ed the, the edgier you are, the better, as long as you're still funny and within reason. Right. Um, a guy, uh, Tim Dillon. Are you familiar with Tim Dillon? No, no, I haven't. Him, I haven't worked with him or heard of him. He's he does a, the uh, yeah. He, but he's like he's wild. Like, <laughs> but he's one of those guys that you need in a time now where people are, you know, like we were saying, the cancel culture. Everybody's mm -hmm. offended by every single thing. You need a guy who just doesn't care about that and just go right. out and you know. Sometimes. Well, you know what it is. I think you know, like, <sighs> it's tough to say because you know. I'm not famous, but if I said something really outrageous where all of a sudden cancel culture got a, got a hold of me, you know, is it really going to ruin me? Probably not because I'm not famous enough to be ruined, but it right. would, you know, I wonder what would happen to someone who is, uh, you know, that famous. I mean, Jesus, you know, you can't, you just look at some of the things that people get canceled for and it's just absolutely crazy. And it's like, who are you to decide what everyone else should, you know, what everyone else should listen to or, or, um, or like, you know, right. That's or be offended by, or be offended by exactly. Yeah. Listen, offend being offended is a very subjective thing. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I had a woman come up to me after a show one time. I was, I raised money. I did a fundraiser for the American Lung Association where we, we raised $12,000 in one night on a comedy show. And a woman came up to me after the show and was like, I really wish you would change your act. And I said, why? She said, because you've offended God. <laughs> and I said, I've offended God. What are you talking about? All that religion <laughs> stuff that you talk about, you've offended God. I said, no, no. I've obviously offended you. And right. I apologize if that offended you, but that's not my intent. My intent is to make people laugh. And pretty much everyone else in that room of 500 people was laughing. Uh, so if I offended you, I'm sorry, but you can't tell me I offended God because if you believe in God, you know that God made me, which means he made my sense of humor, my flaws right. and my talents. And I'm using my talent to raise $12,000 for people with lung disease. I don't think God is going to really be upset that I did a joke about, you know, a drunk guy at a wedding, uh, at the, right. you know, the wedding at Cana asking Jesus to turn some, you know, water in a Tic Tac and a peppermint schnapps. I don't think God's <laughs> going to be offended by that. I just, you know, we just raised all this money for people right. who have disease, you know, but it, it is, it's really in the eye of, and she actually is the sad part. The next day she found my email and she actually emailed me and said, I really hope you'll consider what I said last night about changing your act. I was like, That's so weird. How do you follow up? Like, how do you yeah. just keep bothering somebody? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I obviously, yeah. I didn't engage back with her because I was like, Hey, that says more about you lady than me. I'm, mm. I'm comfortable in my faith and you know what I believe in. And again, I doubt I'm going to get to the pearly gates and St. Peter's going to be like, oh, Ace Cecilio, yeah, you were in, but then you did that wedding at Cana joke in 1970, <laughs> you know, 1992, you know. Right. That, that, that's not the way it works, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it is what that, it is. I feel like um, there might be a few other professions that I can't think of at the moment mm-hmm. uh, that should fly under that kind of radar. Like, yeah. you know, comics, it's, it's part of their job to – criticize exactly. things and, and be cynical and everything exactly exactly yeah. that's a that's a style of humor and being cynical is you know is part of is part of humor that's sarcasm that's cynicism that's part of you know it's a type of humor and if you you know my problem is if you're offended all right that's fine i i get it but that doesn't mean that you should dictate what everyone else should hear right you know, what happened to just like leaving the venue or shutting the station yeah, off? Exactly. What happened to that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny. I did a show maybe about, I don't know, five or six years ago at a 55 plus community out in uh, Middleborough, Mass. Um, yep. And a uh, and <laughs> bunch of people are around me. They're saying, oh, my God, you were so funny. We had so much fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Guy comes up to me while I'm talking all these adoring fans and he comes up and he goes to shake my hand and I, sh- I shook his hand and he said, I just want to tell you as a Catholic, I was highly offended. And he just mm. walked away, like dropped the bomb and walked away. But what I wanted to ask him if he didn't walk away was then why the, f- I-, I don't know. Can I swear on this? Please. Just, oh yeah. I'm like, why the <laughs> fuck did you stay for the whole show then? Did yeah, you yeah. honestly stay for the whole <laughs> show just so you could prove a point and right. tell me that you were offended by me? Yeah. Come on. Those you know, are the that same says people. more about you. That says more about what's in your mind. Yeah. Those are the you same know? people that com- eat your, their whole meal at a restaurant and then complain about and it, but they, don't ask they, for a refund or anything. Exactly. Nothing. Yeah. I just wanted to <laughs> prove my point. Yeah. You know, that's, you can't, you can't worry about it. You know, I mean, it's, it's going to happen because unfortunately that's just the culture that's out there but i think there's enough right. people pushing back on it too because again it's almost like you know cancel culture has no common sense to your point turn the fucking channel you don't yeah. like it turn the channel change it you know you're gonna write to the cable company because they're still showing titty pictures uh you know uh late night on on netflix or you know or or on cable on hbo right. you know right no change the channel don't watch it yeah. You know, it's and that's that's sense. what's that's what's great about the podcast, too, is now it's given yeah. comedians uh, their own fucking platform. They can say whatever the hell they want. 
Exactly. Well, and that's the thing. So like the podcast I do, uh, it says, you know, it's an explicit podcast. No, that doesn't yeah. mean we're going to get into, you know, deep, disgusting, dirty stuff all the time. I mean, there have been times where some guests have gone over and, you know, and we'll ask them sometimes we'll edit some stuff out because it was like, yeah. Eh. You know, the <laughs> first 12, <laughs> the first 12 times you said the C word it was all right. right. But by the 32nd, <laughs> I think, you know, we wanted to cut a little bit of it out. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, because here's the problem. I never forget. There was an interview with Jim Carrey and it wasn't about cancel culture or anything. But I remember him saying, you know, a comic shouldn't have a filter on them because if you have a filter, you're going to sell filter some very, very funny stuff. You're mm. going to sabotage your act by filtering out funny stuff. And so if you don't do that, if you throw, you know, if you just let 10 things come out of your mouth, four or five of them might be, eh, one or two might be way over the top, but three of them might be gold. And you would never know if you didn't have the, the courage to throw all 10 of those things out there. You're never right. going to find out just which ones are, are the gold if you're self-censoring. Right. And I find that's probably the scariest part of doing it because it's like, you yeah. don't know, you know, you're saying you're censoring yourself because you don't know. That's really what it is. Right. It's the unknown. So yeah. it's like, you know, it does take a lot. It takes experience as well to just be like, let me just say it. If it sucks, it sucks. Whatever. Yeah. I don't say it again. Or and, I work and, on it. And when you self-censor, you're letting a minority of people dictate what the majority will hear. And that's not fair to the majority because the majority may feel it's funny, you know? Right. I don't know if you know Mike McCarthy. He's a comic that's been around for a long time uh, here in New England. Uh, started at Periwinkles around the same time as me. Then he moved to Florida for a while. He And now he's back here. But he said it. He said, you know... Uh, he said, I, I can't wait to go down. to. I love working down in Florida and all those retirement communities because they're all people our age and a little bit older that they're not cancel culture. They they right. suck it up. These people live, you know, some of these people live through the, the depression, you know, yeah. <laughs> they can they can handle, you know, someone saying, a, no, uh, food. you know, a hurtful word, you know, yeah, that hurt my feelings. Yeah. These people are like, suck it up, pussy. Yeah, <laughs> I live I through had a depression. no food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I waited in a bread line. That word isn't going to hurt me. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, so how how long? Another thing that I hear, uh, you know, again on on these comedy podcasts is they've mm -hmm. made it more aware. They've made people who listen because a lot of the people are aspiring comics. Yeah. Um, they've made people aware of the process of being a stand up yeah. comedian. A yeah. lot of us, a lot of us who watch it, um, are like, oh, that guy just, you know, he says jokes and he goes up there. But the headliners, the people who, you know, sell out the shows and, and the feature acts and all these guys, it takes a very, very, I, I, and this is yeah. somebody on the outside, but it takes a very, very, how long, how long would you say were you an open micer for? <clears throat> so I was an open micer, truly open micer where I wasn't getting any paid work. You got to remember when I started, you know, the mid, early to mid eighties was the big comedy boom. That's where yeah. like, there weren't a ton of comics um, a lot of people were making good money and it was easy to, to get good fast. When I came in in 1989, it was at the tail end of that boom. So you got to remember, yes, you had open mics, but there was a ton of paid work out there. Right. Um, I think I was probably doing it maybe eight months to a year before I got my first paid gig. It was probably closer to eight months. Um, That's a I, good amount of time, you know, to, to do something that you're not really sure, you know, where yeah. it's going to go, where it's going to end up, you know. And it all worked out. It was it was a matter of, you know, you you did the open mics and some of the guys that were on the open mics were also booking, you know, they were bookers slash comics. Um, and I and, you know, this was at a time where you didn't even have to go to a comedy club. Every restaurant had a back room, a back function room, and they did comedy once a week. Um, right. You know, there was a place out in Mattapoisett called the Mattapoisett Inn, um, where Spain and Narragansett is right now. It used to be a place called Windsor's, 
It okay. was uh, it was a college bar because it was right down the street from URI. They used to have comedy every Sunday. I mean, when I I still have some of my old my old calendars, and I look through it, and it's funny. Like you literally, I worked Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Every week, and you know it was only twenty five bucks, fifty bucks. It wasn't big money when you started, but so I'd say I was truly an open micer for about eight months, and right. then I started getting offered, "Hey, do you want to open this show? Do you want to open this show? It's twenty five. It's fifty. Usually on Wednesday, Thursday was a, a twenty five spot, and Friday, Saturday was fifty. And now, was you, there ever was there ever a time when you were doing multiple spots a night? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you you time. doubled up all the time. Yeah, because. Yeah. You could turn around and say, hey, you know, um, uh, there were a lot of showcases back then, too, like paid showcases. You know, they would pay the headliner decent money and then they would pay a bunch of people like 25, 25 bucks to go up before them. So. They, so, yeah, you would do like. Uh, God, I'm trying to think I would double up and do like Windsor's and then come up to Periwinkles and open the sh open, you know, the show at Perry, gotcha. Wiggles, which was an actual comedy club. Um, so yeah, yeah, you doubled up. You could, you could double up a lot, but it was right. funny. Like I said, I was getting paid and yeah, it was only 25 or 50 bucks a spot. But I mean, I was like, Hey, this is great. I was in college at the time that, you know, I was working full-time, uh, part-time jobs, but this was a great little, you know, bump. Extra and back money, then yeah. everything was cash, you know, I mean, right. there was no, I mean, there was no Venmo, <laughs> there was no Venmo. There was no, you know, no one wrote checks for 25 bucks. It was always cash. Right, um, right. Thank so, God yeah. for Venmo, though, huh? Because it is cool. <laughs> I'm a I'm a server in a restaurant right now. And yep. uh, the worst thing is when people drop 18 cards on the table. Oh, yeah, I know. They're all best friends. You know, they yeah. are. And it's like, just Venmo. Like, what, what yeah, are we doing? Just Venmo here? each other. Put it on one <laughs> card and Venmo. Exactly. I know. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, uh, it it was relatively quick because they needed comics because there were right. so was many rooms. It, yeah, there were so many rooms and there weren't as many comics as there are now. Um, gotcha. Which is surprising that there's as many comics as there are now just because that boom has been over for so long. And I don't know, it'll be interesting to see as we come out of this, how many people still stick with comedy. Uh, as we yeah. come out of the pandemic, you know, there's some people who I know who haven't done a show at all. Um, I've done maybe, maybe 10 shows uh, during the pandemic. I did, uh, I did two shows this past weekend. Oh, wow. um, but, it, you know, it, but it's, it's got to be different. It's very <laughs> different. Um, yeah. The shows I did last year were primarily outdoor shows. So one was a drive-in style. Everyone was parked, you know, their cars were parked in the parking lot. Oh, wow. There was, a, there was like a <laughs> elevated stage, like a platform stage that yep. had a light on it. They had an FM transmitter uh, that was shooting it. So if people wanted to stay in their car and listen to the show, they could because it would come through their radio on a certain channel. Uh, through the FM transmitter. Uh, a lot of people were tailgating in front of their cars. Uh, but it was weird, you know? Yeah, you'd hear You'd think. hear some laughter. And then after a couple of jokes, you'd be like, you guys still with me? And then everyone <laughs> start honking their horn. And I'm like, all right, all right. At least people are still paying attention. <laughs> you know, um, I did another show where we, it was uh, outdoors in a field. It's funny because the shows that I've done over the past year, uh, Three years ago, if you came to me and said, hey, do you want to do this show? It'll, it's going to be in a parking lot. Uh, you're going to have a stage, but people are going to be inside their cars or in front of their cars, um, yeah. you know, for the show. I would have been like, uh, yeah, no, I think I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Now I kill for those. <laughs> I kill for those shows. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's some of the only ones around. That's well, that's it. So I did those. Um, and then there's a guy up in New Hampshire. Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, named Rob Steen, who books a lot of uh, of places. Um, and one of the places he has, there's a, a small theater chain of cinemas up there called Chunkies. 
and they have one in Nashua, one in Pelham, one in Manchester. I think they've got one or two other ones. And what they do is in one of the theaters, they don't have the stadium style, uh, style seats. They have these big leather, like really nice leather chairs. Um, and so they'll, they'll do the comedy in one of the theaters. They have an elevated stage Oh, nice, nice. and then they put a spotlight on you and then everyone is sitting. So, you know, those theaters can fit like 300 people. And so even at 50% capacity, you can still fit 150 people in the room still yeah. makes for a good show. So I've been doing a lot of those, um, you know, recently, uh, I opened, I doubled up the other night, actually, I opened the show in, in Nashua and then went 20 miles or 20 minutes away to, um, Pelham and closed the show in Pelham. Right. Right. That's yeah. yeah that's awesome that there's still, you know, opportunities. Um, a question I had for you because, mm -hmm. I, um, a lot of the time comics talk about their audience size yeah. and, um, obviously you have to act different if you're in a theater, a theater, or if you're in a comedy yeah. club, or if you're in a bar on a Sunday night during football season and nobody's watching you. Exactly. Um, <laughs> like I talk fast. I'm very, very quick. If I'm in a theater, I tend to have to slow down because it takes longer for the, for the noise, you know, the, the voice to travel. And sure. it's almost like it rolls. Like you deliver a line people up front are laughing then it eventually gets up to the middle to the back and then it kind of comes back so you have to pace mm. yourself different in a theater than uh than an intimate room but i like both of them equally you know right that's I super like interesting because that's that's something i would obviously never think of like the way you know you have to go slower in a theater at the, the yeah. voice trap i would never even imagine that <laughs> that's why if you notice people who are doing theater shows they're yeah. slower paced and right. in a theater, act outs uh, work even better because think about it. You're, you know, for someone in the back of the room, you're just this little stick figure up on that stage. So as animated as you can be, it's going to engage the audience even better. It's going to engage right. the people in the back if you're really animated. And that's with anything. I remember uh, I'm a I'm a a huge, you know, music fan, heavy metal, especially. And, you know, they talk about Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden. I mean, that guy jumps and runs all over the stage. And it's because when you're doing Shea Stadium with, you know, 40,000 people, right. you better damn well be running around that stage so that they can see you, you know, and they know that people aren't just standing there playing. And, oh, hell yeah. You know, standing there singing. You know, you want to why when when you would see like uh you know just to go back to george carlin he's yeah. back and forth up and down stopping yep. this that and moving and yeah and it's a, a great point that like you know yeah people are here to see see you so exactly you know on a huge stage <laughs> and and that was a departure from the way you know the way tv normally is like when you're when you would see someone on the tonight show they'd stand there they'd be on their x and they deliver their material and that was it they weren't really animated right but in a theater like carlin richard pryor uh um uh eddie murphy and i mean eddie murphy delirious and raw he owned that stage he walked back yeah. and forth because think about it if you're just in the middle of the stage all right, everyone's now seeing you from whatever point of view they have based on their ticket, right? But if you go to this side of the stage, now all the people on this side of the theater get a closer up view of you. You go to right. this side, these people. So it, it engages the audience more if you're moving around, you know, especially a larger venue like that. I would think uh, doing like, what's it called, in a round? I would in think that'd be like weird. I, I, it is. I, I yeah. did it a couple of times. So, you know, we used to have the place here in Rhode Island, the Warwick Musical Theater. Yeah. And that was uh, I think it was six thousand people, but it was a theater in the round. And what was. Yeah, what was weird is depending on who it was, if the stage was mostly clear. It was a little bit easier because you could walk around and you could stick with people because if it's going around and you deliver the setup here and then you deliver the punchline to someone over here, it 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 kind of takes away from it. So what you right. want to do is you want to kind of say, here's my setup. 
Now I'm going to walk as the stage is bringing me over here. I'm going to walk. I'm going to stay with you so that I could deliver the punchline to you. Even though everyone else is, is listening, the continuity of the joke is just between you and me. And now, right. now I'll look over here and I'll deliver a setup here and a punchline here. And then it'll turn and I'll do it here. It is a little weird because you, as a comic, you never want to have your back towards someone, but your back mm -hmm. is always towards someone when you're playing in the round. Right. Because it's I a you know, revolving stage. Yeah, I immediately think of Dane Cook. What was that? Vicious yeah. Circle? Yeah. And he's yeah. just running back. He had to probably All have done over. it the best. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, he set the precedent for uh, being animated, doing act outs, and really working that, that round stage because not too many right. – <clears throat> not every comic could do that, you know. Now, what about the the horror stories? All I hear, you know, it's it's obviously not all sunshine and rainbows <laughs> when you're trying to, you know, be a comic. Yeah. Um, but before I, you know, you you tell me a little bit about yours. I want to tell you about the last time I did stand up comedy okay. because it's my PTSD horror story. <laughs> is um, this why you're not doing it anymore? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. This podcast has actually given me a little bit more, uh, I guess, confidence is the word. In um, getting back up. Yeah. To go ahead and try it again. And plus, now I, you know, I have a little bit more respect for the process of it. You know, you're not going to be funny every night. That's just right. what it is. Nope. Yeah. Um, Everyone has bad nights. Yeah. Exactly. So I did one of those contests you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, I did a contest at the pub on park. Uh, yep. Mr. Parada was running it. And yep. there were some people there who were, some of them were open micers. I did some shows with them. I, you know, I had a show at the comedy connection I did with a few people that I, that I recognized there, but there were yeah. also some very, very funny, like kind of polished, polished comics. Yes. A little Maybe more they've refined. been doing it like five years, six years. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I got there and I had this uh, this kind of set written out. And I, but I yep. wrote it at the beginning of the week and said, I'm just going to practice it in my room. And then I'm going to go and do a completely new set that I've never done in front of anybody. Don't know how to work it. Never did it. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Yeah. And, you know, whatever. I'm going to make it funny. It'll be good. <laughs> and yeah. uh yeah. <laughs> so, some of the topics for but before i tell you about what happened some of the topics that i i decided to write about were a little maybe past my experience level to make okay. funny yeah um, uh, yeah yeah <laughs> trying like, to be provocative but not having that experience to yes. kind of negotiate right like we right. were talking about before like i had i had a funny premise now yeah. stick with me here i had a funny premise <laughs> about um, i'm not judging <laughs> uh, the premise was like, okay, what if, uh, you know, the slave trade was switched, right? And like kings from Africa went to, you know, London and brought a bunch of white people over to, yep. to you know, to be slaves. To and, be slaves and the, down in Africa. Yeah. And the joke to me, the funny part was it was like, oh, you know, white people are going to start complaining. I need sunscreen and I need my Starbucks. And that was yeah. kind of the joke. <laughs> Right, right. So, <laughs> so I didn't deliver it in a very good way. Um, <laughs> it's a, there's so many times where the premise is really funny and yeah. you just can't figure out how to make other people understand the premise and the meaning without taking it out of context. Because, right. yeah, that's a touchy subject. Slavery yeah. is not, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a white dude doing a slavery joke automatically. Yeah. On paper, you're like, ah, this ain't going to go well. But right. if you have the experience to really negotiate and say, no, no, hear me out. But yeah. that takes time to be able to do that, you know? Right. And <laughs> and that was like wedged in between like a Trump joke about like yeah. wanting to bang his daughter. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, that was the, the – it was kind of a, a, a brand new but very provocative set that I had never yeah. used. And I show up and I'm nervous because I, I, I'm not prepared, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, and I look at the list and I and I immediately see that I'm the first one up there. Oh, and uh, and I even go to I even ask John, I'm like, I'm, I'm num number one. This, I'm the first one. And he's like, uh, yeah, yeah, you're going to come out swinging. And yeah. I'm like, OK, so I went yeah, up there. Oh, I'm and, swinging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I did this awful set, just a terrible set. No laughs. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible cadence, no timing. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was the first one up. 
right? After the host, the host got everybody or whatever. And now it's me. And that wasn't enough, right? That wasn't like the, the enough to put me overboard that it was a terrible thing. Yeah. Everybody else after me killed. Uh, like there might've been 14 people after me and they all killed. It was a huge, great. big crowd. It might've been a hundred people, something like that. Right. And, uh, and that was my PTSD moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, here's the thing. And we talk about it on our podcast. It's, it's, uh, everyone's going to have bad sets. What makes yeah. a true comic, a true comic is whether you have a good set or a bad set, you need to get back up on stage. Yeah. If you have a great set, you need to get back up on stage because you just fed that massive ego that you have and you want more. And yeah. if you have a bad set, you want to get that stank off you. You want to be like, all right, I know I can do better than that. I know I can make people laugh. I right. need to get back up on stage and try it. Um, and that's, you know, that's two different people. I mean, Frank O'Donnell, I mentioned him earlier. He told a story one time how he opened for Michael Bolton. All right. And this was before, <laughs> before Michael Bolton was like, uh, like, you know, a, a pop singer, he was actually, uh, in a metal band and he was, he, you know, he was, he was like in a rock band. Um, and he said it was at the civic center was at the Dunkin' Donuts center. And he said it was horrible. He yeah. said 16,000 people all yelling, get off the stage, boo, get <laughs> off the stage. He said he got off the stage when he was done, got paid. And immediately went over to Periwinkles wow. and and wanted to get back up on stage because he needed to prove to himself like, no, that was just a bad situation I was in, you know, and, and uh, like I said, in, on our podcast, we actually came out one of our earlier episodes. We had a panel of other comics. In fact, I believe John Parada was one. Mike McCarthy was the other. We might have had one more. And what we did was because of the horror stories that you hear, um, we tried to come up with a list of 10 things that as a comic, if any of these things are like, if you get hired for a show and you see any of these 10 things, you should run the other way because it's going to be a bad gig. And that's what we <laughs> named. We named the episode. It's going to be a useful list. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> we named, we named the episode. It's you know it's going to be a bad gig when, and then dot dot dot. And wow. we actually couldn't come up with just ten. We we narrowed the list down to twelve. Twelve situations where if you're put in them uh, as a comic, you know it's going to be a bad gig. And one of the one of them was comedy and music. Anytime right. someone asks you as a comic, hey. You're really funny. Do you want to open up for my band? Say no. <laughs> it never works. Not unless you're Jim fucking Brewer, who's going right. to go up there and do, you know, Brian Johnson and ACDC and sing and, you know, do anything but regular stand up. It's yeah. not going to work. They just are different crowds. I've right. had friends who are in bands ask, hey, do you want to do a set in front of us? And I'm like, no. You know what? You want me to go up there and announce you guys? I absolutely, but I am not going to do material because this this crowd didn't come to see comedy; they came right. to see a band, you know. And it's yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it, it's amazing the situations that we get put in. Like one of the situations that'll happen is uh, you're doing a fundraiser, and it's kind of a somber event because you're raising funds for someone who's sick or someone who passed away or, right. uh, or, or is passing away. And right before you get up there, the organizer says, we're just going to go up and say a few words first. If that happens, Antonio <laughs> run the other way because those few they're gonna words, just shit all over the room. <laughs> they what they're gonna do is they're gonna bring the room down because right. they're gonna start with the, what we call the memorial mass. Yeah. Uh, let's just talk about Jim. 
uh, let's and they unveil a picture of Jim who died in the line of duty at a you know as a firefighter who passed away in the line of duty and right. Jim's you know his parents are here tonight and his kids are here and it's such a special night and blah 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 and then they show a memorial video of Jim and then and then at the end of it they go okay now it's time for comedy. <laughs> Here's a Cecito. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. That you might as well forget it. It's gonna yeah. suck. That is gonna right. be a horrible show. Right. So uh so yeah, it's amazing. Scott, my my co-host Scott uh Higgins, he's a comic out of Connecticut. We laugh all the time about the crazy situations that we're put in. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean I hear about him. I hear about, you know. There's a room in a in a, a Chinese restaurant or something on Tuesday nights. Like you hear like the oh, outlander yeah. stuff. What about when you go to like uh, you know a region, you know maybe like in the south or something or, yep. or an area that you have to kind of work around. Yeah, you, you have to you have to change stuff up, especially when you do parochial stuff like I do. That's mm. so entrenched in like New England and New England weather. You kind of have to change it a little bit. You you could still right. explain it, you know. You could say, "Hey, you know, down south, uh, you know, did they ever cancel school for tornadoes? Like, do you guys have tornado days? Because up north we have snow days. You know, if we know it's going to snow, they'll cancel school. Right, and then right. I'll kind of go <laughs> into my joke. Um, you they're not gonna they're not gonna get it as much as someone who lives in this area, but yeah. it's still salvageable as a joke because it's still funny to hear the announcer voice and, you know, have the traffic guy be Bobcat Goldwaite or, you right, know, the, right, right. the morning news guy be Gilbert Gottfried. So you do, you might, there are things that you might have to change when you go out of state, you know, like right. I don't, I, I do in my act, I talk when I'm in Rhode Island, I talk, I have a whole section where I ask the audience about crappy, shitty places to come from in Rhode Island. Um, cause I say, you know, I came from North Providence and people always made fun of it. I never understood that there were worse places in the state of Rhode Island you could come from. So I have oh, a name, yeah. you know, I have them <laughs> yell out those things. But when I was up in New Hampshire this weekend, I didn't do that part of my act. I just, right. I just said, you know, public school and Catholic school, you know, but when I'm in Rhode Island, I have to talk Foster Gloucester because those were the public school kids that I couldn't stand because they never had school. You know, right, they were right, the first right. ones to get school canceled. That's how that joke kind of first came about. But yeah, you have to you have to tweak things a little bit when you, uh, you know, when you when you're outside of your region. Right. Yeah. Now, do you come from the school of thought that like, all right, it was the writing that wasn't funny, or do you think it was the audience, or sometimes is it both? Because um, I've heard I've heard you know mixing mixing views where yeah. it's like okay this joke kills in 30 of these places but yeah 10 of them it doesn't maybe it's the audience you know what you you never want to blame the audience because it's you as the comic to figure out what is going to make them laugh right. um for example uh you know we're currently in the season of len <laughs> i start doing these religious jokes about you know about you know a drunk guy at the wedding at cana asking Jesus to make, you know, peppermint schnapps. This past weekend, that joke went fine. Yeah. But if I do that during Holy Week, like the week before Easter, I'm going to get booed off stage or they're, they're not just working, not. Yeah. It's too heavy a subject for them. Right. Especially most Catholics are feeling guilty because they didn't go to church all year. And they're only going to go on Easter and Christmas. Some of them right. haven't been to church in years. So it gets into people's minds. So um, so in that case, I would have to, you know, kind of divert. If people are getting a little bit too uptight about the religion stuff, they tend to be fine with dirtier stuff, um, which right. is weird. You would think, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, you, I can't make fun of religion, but I can, you know, talk about Ray Romano getting a blowjob. You know, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it makes no sense, but it, it that's how it happens, you know? Right. It's just um, certain topics, I guess, sometimes. Certain topics at certain times. But you never want right. to blame the audience. Like, people will be like, oh, that audience sucked. Yeah, maybe they did. You never know. Typically, um, certain audiences throughout a weekend aren't as good as others. Friday night's second show, historically, is always a sucky 
audience because it's all psychology. Think about right. it. Friday, you worked all day, right? Now you get together with your significant other. You go out to dinner. You have a few drinks. You you know you're talking, and now you go in. You sit in a comedy club where you need to be quiet, and it's the first time since six o'clock in the morning that you're sitting there quietly, right? Not doing anything. And you've had a couple of drinks. So now you keep drinking. One of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to turn into an asshole because of the alcohol, or you're going to get so drunk that you're going to fall asleep during the show. Yeah. Because you're tired. So Friday night second show typically is not a great audience. Right. Um, you know, Saturday second show, not great, but better than the Friday second show because you got to sleep late on Saturday. You didn't have to work all day. Maybe you did stuff, but it's not as bad. But early shows are usually better, um, well-received. It's, it's kind of crazy how, you know, the more we talk about this, the more you kind of realize that comedians also have to have just a good sense of awareness when it comes to the room, when it comes yeah. to, you know, the region, the the time of year, the, um, you know, all, all the psychology, like you're saying, psychology. there's so many different things. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of psychology too, and we've talked about. Uh, we actually did an episode of the psychology of comedy, where you know a lot of people will be like, "How do you deal with a heckler?" Uh, you know, I have the benefit being the headliner. If there's a heckler in the room, if they're still heckling by the time I get up on stage after two other comics have tried to take care of them, I find a heckler does heckles for one of two reasons. One, either they think their heckling is going to make the show better or so they think they're helping the comics by heckling or right. two, they think they're a frustrated wannabe comic. They think they're funnier than the comics up on stage. So right. they're going to fuck with them by heckling with by heckling them. And what happens is. In both senses, they're trying to get attention. They want to be the center of attention, but they want to be the center of attention in a positive light. So what I end up doing is I just ignore them. Right. I, if they keep yelling out, I just ignore them. And one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to get tired of it because they realize I'm not going to give in to them and they, they end up being quiet. Or if they go continue to do it, I wait until halfway through my act and think about it. Two other comics were up there. They tried to shut them up. I get up there. I'm halfway through my act. They're still not shutting up. How do you think the audience feels about them right now? I'm fucking annoyed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I have the audience on my side. All I have to do is say one. And it's not even anything that I wrote. There's stock lines you can say. It's like, hey, I'm getting paid to be an asshole. Don't do it for free. Right, or, right. <laughs> you know, you remember, uh, I think Dice did it. He's like, hey, you know, this is my job. I don't kick the dustpan and brush out of your hands at Wendy's. Right, right. You know, <laughs> it's anything like that. It doesn't even matter what you say. Yeah. It, some, you know, some people will just say, hey, I got a question. How many people came here to see me up on stage? Right. And how many people came to see this douchebag talk? How many right. did you guys pay for this guy? And, the audience is already on your side. The audience is already on your side. Sometimes yeah. if they're so drunk, they don't even realize what's going on. Right. I'll just roll my eyes and go, all right, let's do this. You guys with me? <laughs> like they're still talking. They're in their own world. And I'm like, you guys with me? And the rest of the audience is like, yeah, I go, all right, on the count of three, let's just yell, shut the fuck up. And I'll go <laughs> one, two, three. And when, let me tell you, when a heckler gets told to shut the fuck up by an entire room, they, they shut, shut the up. Fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> they either shut up or they leave. And either right. way, either way, now the rest of the show can be enjoyed by the audience. Because think about it. Someone goes in and pays 15, 20 bucks to go to a show. The last thing they want to hear is some douchebag in the, in the audience yelling right. shit out at the comics. You know, messing up their jokes because they're, you know, they're throwing off the, the timing and the rhythm. Right, right. Even right. if the comic is good and can recover, it's still it, it's a lot more work for the rest of the audience to keep up with the show. 
So. It definitely is funny, though, when certain guys shit on a heckler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but if you try and do it too early, right. you're giving them what they want. They want to yeah. be part of the show. You know, right, that's why right, I right. give them a chance. I'll do a good, you know, out of a 45 minute set, I'll do 20, 25 minutes where I don't acknowledge them. So I'm giving you a chance to learn. I'm not going to give you the time of day and you're only pissing everyone else off around you. Right, right. And if they're too oblivious to realize that, that's when I'm going to come out and come after them. You know, so so how long kind of you can give me two numbers here, I guess, yeah. on the short end and on the high end. How <laughs> long would you say it takes uh, someone to get to a place where they can say, all right, I can make money off this. I can either make this, uh, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a passion thing or I can make this my life. I can be a full time comic, you know. I don't I don't know because, yeah. you know, because I came up at a different time where guys were after four or five years, they were like, OK, now I, I need to either move to New York or L.A. or I'm just going to be that local headliner around here. But there was also a lot more work back then, you know, right. I don't know how honestly, especially during the pandemic, you know, knock on wood, I have a day job. I work in medical sales during the day. So. I had that to fall back on. I don't know how full-time comics are surviving right now, mm. um, especially non-famous ones. You know what I mean? Just guys that were just like road comics where they would just go out and, you know, pound away every weekend, do two shows in Ohio and drive to, you know, Illinois and do a couple of shows there. I don't right. know how they're doing it uh, because there's not as much, even pre-COVID, there wasn't as much work like that. You know, um, and, right. you know, I think I, I've gotten accustomed to to my day job, so I could never <laughs> I could never give that up at this point. Um, sure. You know, so I, I don't know. You know, I think it goes it's more. It's hard to put by, a number on. Well, I think it goes more by how long before you can get a solid, clean hour of material, because as much as like I do some dirty stuff, but a fair amount of my stuff is clean and you can always dirty up a clean act. You can't clean up a dirty act. Right. You know what I mean? Um, if you're dirty, you just, you got to roll with it the whole way. <laughs> exactly. You got to roll with yeah. it the whole way, but it's also going to limit the amount of work you get, you know, sure. like, um, you know, I do a lot of stuff. I'm a, one of the branch managers, owners of funny for funds, and we specialize in comedy night fundraisers. And, you know, we're doing a lot of things for like church organizations, kids organizations. You can't be filthy dirty when you're raising money for kids or you're raising money for a church, you know. Right. Um, right. I mean, I do one of the shows that I've done two years in a row. Unfortunately, we didn't get to do it last year, but hopefully we'll do it again this year is for, uh, you know, a Knights of Columbus. And they do it at a church in the church hall. You can't have dirty. You can't do dirty jokes in a church hall. It's not going right, to go right. over well. People, you know, you got an older crowd. The people are you're not going to. They're not going to go for it. So I'd say, you know, if you want to make a living at it, you want to have 45 minutes to an hour of clean material that consistently does very well. Because the other sure. thing you can do, um, not that you have to be clean, because this has changed even in the past 20 years. You used to have to be squeaky clean to be a, a cruise ship comic. Yeah. And cruise ships, you can make really good money, um, you know, but you're out, you know, you're out for like two weeks at a time, hopping ship to ship. Um, you do uh, uh, each ship. You would do like a day show for like a half an hour, uh, like an onboard. As people are coming on board, they'll come to the show. But sure. there's kids in the audience, so you're going to be clean. And then you do an hour show or a 45 minute show that night that can be dirtier. Um, so you can make money doing that. But now, again, no one's cruising. They don't know when right. cruise ships are going to be opening back up. They're hoping by summer or fall. But we'll you know, we'll see. So Another... I think it's different for everyone. All right. Another thing that um, is super interesting. And I mean, it's across all different arts. Um, but you see it definitely in stand-up, is uh, 
for me personally, I, this is going to sound weird to say, but I like my artists to have a very terrible background, like to have, <laughs> having a fucked up life as a kid, yeah, right? right? <laughs> those, those to yeah. me are the best. Um, so I feel like, but I do feel like in stand up, we see it very, very often where you have, yeah. you know, people who come from like, for example, one of my favorite comedians who I've been listening to for, oh, I don't know, maybe four or five years now, Joey Diaz. He yeah. came yep. from a awful, awful, you know, horrible oh, addiction yeah. and all these different things. But like these guys, when they come out on the other side, they end up being very, very successful. Well, cause there's comedy from tragedy. Once you can, you know, once you can pull away from the tragedy and see the funniness in it, like, you know how they say, if, if I didn't laugh, I'd cry. Right. That's it. it. You know, if I didn't, uh, you know, turn this around, I'd be crying over it, you know? Sure. Um, so yeah, to your point, a lot of people do come from it. It's funny. I laughed when you said that because I once had, uh, I was at a club up in Andover, Mass. It used to be called the Grill 93, the Comedy Palace. And one of the owner's daughters, I don't know, she was there one night. She was like 19 years old. I was in my, like, I think I was like early 30s. Yeah. And she, she, we were sitting there and after about talking to her just for about a half an hour, just kind of bullshit. And she goes, wow. She goes, you're like one of the first well-adjusted comedians I've ever met. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you got your you're head a well on your put shoulder. Guy. <laughs> yeah. You have a regular job and you're yeah. funny on stage and yeah. you know, you're not like, you know, it, it, it's because most times in order to, to do comedy, you kind of come from this, you know, messed up side. Um, right. But again, yeah, from... to, to your point. Yeah. Joey Diaz came from a shitty family. Richard Pryor was born in a whorehouse, a like, brothel, you know, yeah. a brothel. So, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, but what did he do? He turned it into something funny. You know, he would turn yeah. around and, and do the whole bit about when his mom used to beat him with a switch and make yeah. him go and get it. You know, he goes, yeah, hey, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. that was at an insult to injury. I had to go pick <laughs> it up, you know, and, and I couldn't come back with no little one. I got to come back with a full size. That would, it, she wanted it to hurt. I needed to make yeah, sure yeah. it hurt, you know. <laughs> now think about yeah. it. Think about that. That's like, right. you know, you're talking about getting whipped as a kid. Yeah. But he turned it into something funny. Yeah. You know? It's almost like the greater the tragedy, the greater. If, if you can angle it right, the greater the hilarity in it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But that's where the talent comes in and the, you right. know, getting used to doing that stuff. Um, right. Right. And even him, just to a point, like you said earlier, even he's just talking about his life. What happened to him? Right. It just happened yeah. to be shitty. <laughs> it's it's. And what did I say at the very beginning of this? It's it's got to come from a, a place of truth. You know right. what I mean? People right. can sense when you're full of shit. You know, right. unless you're trying to be, you know, there's a couple of jokes that I do where I have a smirk on my face. So, you know, I'm full of shit. You know, I'm busting sure. chops because I'm also exaggerating things. You know what I mean? I talk about my car being a piece of shit and it's this little tiny car. And I say, you know, most cars, you know, you can roll start it. You, you know, you put it in second gear and pop the clutch and starts right up. And I'm like, this piece of shit, I'd pick it up, drag it across the ground three times backwards. And then it took off. <laughs> like that's an exaggeration. You know right. that that's, you know, not true, but you have to let the audience know that it's an exaggeration, you know? Right, right, right. So, <clears throat> well, Hey man, um, before we wrap this thing up, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, you actually mentioned to me before we started this, that you've been doing a podcast for a while, four years. Yeah. So uh, my yeah. Scott, my uh, my co-host and I have been doing this podcast. It's called Behind the Funny. Um, yeah. In fact, I'm in my podcast studio right now. I don't know if you can see the I can see the mics <laughs> live live. Well, and that's our live from the basement. We had uh, oh, I don't know if shit, you're familiar nice. with I don't know if you're familiar with Brendan Kirby from the Roadshow. No, nope. um, but we he's one of the hosts of the Roadshow here in Rhode Island. And, uh, and he, we had him on as a guest and he, he, he said, Oh, this is really nice down here. You know, I think you should call it the acement instead of the basement. And wow. it just stuck. And then we had someone do the graphics for it. So yeah, we That's come great. out every, every Thursday, we just interview comics. Scott had it. The way he started the podcast was, um, if you remember that show inside the actor's studio with James Lipton, 
where he would interview an actor and it would really get in depth about where they grew up. How did they get into acting? Where did they train? And so Scott wanted to do a similar thing for comics. And that's basically what behind the funny it's what made that person get up on stage. Every one of us, like you started the, the pot, your, this episode off asking me how I started. Right. Everyone has a story like that. And everyone's reason for starting is totally different. Um, sure. And so we find that very, very interesting. And then we get into like highlights, lowlights, um, you know, some wow moments of their careers. Uh, we recently had a guy on who started with me at Periwinkles years ago. And now he's actually been the executive producer and writer on a bunch of the Comedy Central roasts. So he doesn't oh, wow. do stand up. He doesn't do stand up anymore, but he is still very involved, more so in the writing. And now I don't know if you're familiar with that show, uh, Snoop and Martha's Potluck Dinner. Yes, it's yes, where yes. Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart get together and cook. And cook he's yeah. actually <laughs> the he's actually the executive producer and showrunner on that show. His oh, name wow. is Chris McGuire. Yeah. So that's it. We we talk to new people. We talk to established people. We've talked to a ton of the Boston headliners. Uh, we've had uh, Tom Cotter on, uh, you know, from America's Got Talent. We've had Bobby Collins on, who's been, you know, on. Uh, he was one of the original hosts of VH1 Stand Up Spotlight. So we, okay. you know, we've got a real good mix of of people, and it's really just much like what you're doing here. It's just conversation. Uh, it's. Um, very conversational. The one thing right. we ask about, kind of like what you did uh, around the hell stories, we ask people <laughs> for a funny bad gig story. And the right. funny bad gig is a little bit different because that's that gig that you did and it wasn't funny the night it happened. You wanted to quit comedy. Yeah. But the further away from that night you get, you start to find funny points. Like, I can't believe this was the situation I was put in. To the point of what I said before, those 12 categories that we came up with, you know, it's going to be a bad gig. We get right. people to tell that story because what happens is then you're working six months down the road. You're working with a bunch of other comics and everyone's telling their war stories yeah. and you're sitting there and you're like, oh, you think that's bad? Everyone's laughing <laughs> at how bad the situations you're in. Right. And yeah. then you go, oh, you think that's bad? Listen to this one. Right. And usually those are the funny bad gig stories and we're in the process now actually of writing a book uh oh, wow. of compiling all of because we've got four That's years worth idea. we've got four years <laughs> worth of funny bad gig stories yeah in fact one of our most downloaded episodes every year every year we end the year with a best of that year so we do a two-part series with the best of so like best of 2020 was back in december Right. And then we always do a best of the funny bad gig stories of the year. So those are separate. Um, and those are some of the most downloaded episodes we get every year because people oh, yeah. love hearing other imagine. people's pain, you know? Yeah. Especially <laughs> comics. We love hearing about how another comic died, you know what I oh, mean? Right, right. On stage or in a room <laughs> or whatever it was. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so I appreciate that. Let me give a, a put, plug out. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spreaker, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, uh, Pandora. Basically, any way you get podcasts, we're on there. It's right. behind, behind the funny. Is there video as well? You on YouTube? Not yet. So we're okay. on YouTube right now. Uh, we're on YouTube. Um, but it's only been recently and we're only audio. So it just has audio. our logo and it's only gotcha. audio. We're actually launching. In fact, I'll announce it on your show first on uh, there we go. April 7th. We are going to be uh, going live on a uh, I guess it's a like a network. You would call it a podcast network yep. called Drinks, Jokes and Storytelling. Um, ah. And it was started by a guy named Mark Riccadonna and Richie Byrne, who are two comics from New York. Mark used to book Stand Up New York years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, and so they do it on Twitch, which is a uh, I guess it's really for like it started with video games. People would watch yep. other people do video games on it. And so they went on Twitch and they started this network. So our time slot is going to be. Uh, Wednesday nights from 8 to 9 p.m. 
Oh, wow. uh, you can catch us. Uh, and what we're going to do, we're doing it on a thing instead of like this on Zoom, we're doing it on something called StreamYard. Um, so people can see us on a Wednesday night record. If not, if they can't, you know, watch it, then that episode will be out a couple of weeks later, just on the regular gotcha. podcast platforms, audio wise. And I think we can, once we're all, once we are done with an episode on Twitch, we can rip the video and then we can put that on YouTube. So we're growing, we're, we're trying to get bigger. Um, right. You know, we, uh, we, like I said, it's consistency. We've been doing it consistently for four years and uh, we're, we're seeing growth, you know, it's like, you get to these different plateaus, you know, I don't know if you check your numbers all the time, but we do this, we do it all the time. We're checking numbers sure. and, um, you start and to get sick over them. If you look at them too much. Though. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like what happened that month? And, yeah. But we've been steadily growing. We, uh, you know, for a small podcast with two like unknown guys, uh, we've been getting around 11,000 downloads a month. Um, oh, wow. And from all over the country, we've had some we've actually had some people download from from Southeast Asia. We've had people in Myanmar, uh, South Korea, oh, South Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got to remember, I mean, there's probably people who move to, you know, to those places for work or whatever. And they want to, you know, they want to be, you know, if someone from New England moves to Myanmar and they want to feel like back in New England, they want to hear this ridiculous accent that we have. <laughs> You know, they listen yeah. to a podcast of, 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 you know, comics talking about the Boston comedy scene and stuff like that. You right. Know? So, um, so you guys are on Thursdays and you can be found on all the audio platforms. Pretty all much. the audio platforms. A new episode comes out every Thursday. And then, like I said, on uh, Wednesday, uh, April 7th, we're going to go live. We're actually having Mark Riccadonna the comedian from new york who got us on his on his network he's going to be our first guest but oh, wow, he's been okay. doing comedy for a really long time very funny guy and he actually just put out a um they did the longest streaming comedy show uh to raise money for um two charities and we did it maybe about a month and a half ago and Scott and I were on it at one point. They had Jessica Kershaw on it. They've had they had Paul Provenza. They had I mean they've comics from all throughout the country were on this thing. Keg, uh, Craig Gas was on it for a while. I was right. on right at the end with uh, with Craig and a couple of other people. Uh, so that's how we kind of got hooked up with them. And uh, you know yeah. we did that and and they kind of said, hey, you should come on our network. So that's what we're doing. Just trying. Yeah, to Yeah. Just that concept alone, it sounds like a um, a show for people who like stand-up comedy and yeah. people who maybe want to try or people who are already stand-up comedians. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah. And, and, and it's like I said, even new comics, even people who aren't famous have a story to tell. Everyone has a story to tell. That's what right. comics are. We're storytellers. And so hopefully what we're getting out of our guests are funny stories that – People may have always wondered, like, what is it like being a comic? What do they yeah. think of? Why does their mind think a certain way? You know, and that's really what we delve into on, on behind the funny. So, right. Well, that's awesome. Um, Thanks, I hope man. everybody, uh, everybody that listens to this, which is far less than the people that listen to you. Um, <laughs> <Take whatever laughs> hopefully, we can uh, get. yeah, um, hopefully they check it out. Uh, where else can they find you? Facebook, social media? Yeah, Facebook, um, uh, Ace Acido on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, I'm just venturing into TikTok because I found a deep fake app that will put someone else's face on mine. And so I'm doing oh, a lot gotcha. of I'm doing trying to do like impressions on on TikTok to try and get, you know, get up there with that. Um, right, right. I also have a website. It's uh, www.aceacido. So A C E a C E T O dot L O L instead of dot com. It's dot L O L oh, is an awesome. extension that you can get. <laughs> and that's got my website. There's voiceover stuff on there. There's clips, uh, video clips, audio clips. Uh, eventually there will be a schedule up there when we're able to come back. Uh, you know, sure. so, uh, so yeah, check it out. All right, guys, that, uh, that concludes it for today. Thank you so much, Ace, for doing this. Definitely appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you having me on anytime. Yes. 
Yes, sir. All right, guys. I'll talk to you guys Monday. Peace.